Okay, good. Good evening. It's good to have everyone with us this afternoon. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you uh, with us. And I invite you to come back with us. Any can you can visit with us. Uh, if you will, please uh, fill out a visitor's card and, and uh, hold on to it. There's some boxes in the back of the, uh, as you exit the auditorium, if you'll put it in one of those boxes, we'll have a record of your attendance. We sure would appreciate it. Have a few announcements and uh, we'll get into uh, the, the rest of our services. Uh, Yolanda Beard, a friend of Shannon Brown and uh, World Bible School student, is having health issues. Uh, Angela Lopez is not only home, but she's here this morning, sitting up here. So we're good to, ha good to see her. Uh, so let's keep her in our prayers. Also, former member Ch uh, Charlotte, Charlotte Hill will be having heart surgery in June. Um, okay, tonight is senior night. And so we'll be honoring uh, three of our graduates, Madeline Edwards, Caitlin Glass, and Kylie Smith. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what's going on a little bit later on and, and, uh, after we have our, um, our closing song and closing prayer. Uh, we're collecting su supplies for Mission Mississippi, and uh, they need to be here by Wednesday night. Uh, there's a good bit of stuff out there and everything. I don't know whether that list has been completed yet, but uh, if, you've, if you've said you were going to bring it, make sure that you have it there. Uh, here before uh, Wednesday night. Uh, the clothing giveaway and health fair is July the 16th at 8.30 a.m. Uh, we're needing uh, donations for gently worn and clean clothes. If you're interested in helping, please see Shonda Freeman or uh, sign up on the uh, four years list. Uh, the school supply drive, we have several items that are on there and they'll be in the bulletin. And so uh, make note of that. If you're willing to participate in that, we'll uh, be uh, passing those a uh, list of those things that will be, uh, ne be needed. Um, group 4, card, crew, uh, card group 4 is going to meet tonight in B1. That's Dustin Jeffords and Michael Griffith. Let's also remember Sarah Wald in our prayers. She uh, came forward this morning uh, and we had prayers for her. Also, too, uh, the last one that, is, that I have here is we're collecting cookies for VBS. Please bring all donations by June the 12th. Okay, let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for another opportunity that we've, uh, we've had to come before you and this afternoon, and we pray that you would be with us as we enter into this worship service. We pray that as we lift our songs, or our, our singing up into songs, we pray that you'd be with us and help us to not only sing the songs and the words, but also pay attention to the message that's uh, presented in the songs. And pray that you'd be with Gary as he comes forward in just a few minutes to deliver us a lesson and help him to remember the things that he studied and so that we can gain much from uh, and, and help our knowledge of, uh, of, your, of your word. Father, we pray that you'd be with us as we enter into our service and help us always to keep our minds focused on what we're here for and help us always to look to you for the guidance and the strength that we need to, uh, to keep in favor with you. Father, help, we, Father, we ask that you be with us in our daily lives and help us always to do the right things and be a good example in wherever we are. Father, we pray that you can be, continue to be with those we've mentioned as being sick and help them also to, uh, uh, to recover and to, uh, to get a measure of health restored to them. Father, we just pray that you continue to be with us Throughout this service, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first two songs this morning will be 256 and then 257.
book and would like to mark the song of encouragement, it'll be 696. 696 with a song after the lesson. And having done that, we'll sing 218. 218, if you could please stand. I know. myself all the time. Anybody ever, ever asked me or challenges me and said, you said, well, believe me, I've got a recording. I'll go back and listen to it. And if I made a mistake, I'll correct it. I guarantee you that. Good to be with you. Good evening. Good to see everybody this evening. I'm so happy. Uh, we got a, a lot of good folks here. Thankful that Angel is, is in the audience after uh, some struggles. We're thankful that she's back. And, and with us, she's got that big smile that always, that helps the preacher, I'll tell you, has somebody in front that's, that uh, looks like they're, at least they're enjoying themselves, <laughs> that's what you're hoping for, uh, and that we're all learning something. That there's also somebody else here uh, that I want to mention, that's Sam Lawrence. I, I, I got to sit down with Andy and talk to Sam not a year ago, but it's been a while, uh, at any rate, and we talked about uh, what he wanted to do with his life, and he made a commitment to make a huge change. Uh, he left his job at the time, and he's gone to uh, Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies. He's now gone through two terms there, if I remember correctly. I got to see him at the lectureship. He's thoroughly involved there, and... Uh, being nosy like I am, I talked to some of the instructors and and uh, and to the director and found out he's doing uh, doing very well and I'm thankful for that. Uh, he had an interesting opportunity this morning that uh, I can't wait to hear the recording of uh, because I haven't had that exact opportunity. I've had something similar one time, uh, but I want to I want to give a shout out to him and you know it's always good to say hello to all of our visitors. You know, make, make an effort 
to say hello. They need to learn what we already know. This is a big family. Everybody loves everybody here. And yeah, we occasionally have problems with each other. But we get over it. We find a way. And that's the way it ought to be. Of course, this is, this is the night that we honor graduates. We're talking about those that are honored as high school graduates, but we have other graduates uh, in uh, this audience and those that we love that may not be in this audience, but still, they're graduating and ha or have graduated recently. Uh, that's a big, big change in life. It, it gives an opportunity to make other changes along the way, and of course, if they're like I am, there, there was a huge change. You know, I went to school uh, at Freed Hardman. I, I went from Arizona, Mesa, Arizona. And I, other than going back for a visit, I have never lived in Arizona again since that time. So see, graduation can make a, a pretty big difference uh, in your life, just in that regard. There are other things that might bring about differences, changing job uh, status, maybe you change to a new job, maybe you retire from your old one, that's a change too. Uh, or a move, people make moves, that's a change. All these changes uh, really open us up to the idea that change is possible. I don't, I don't know if you realize this, maybe it's not true about you, but it's true about me. Uh, I, I think things are pretty good the way they are. I don't like my wife to move the furniture, I'll be honest with you. Uh, it's a little bit disconcerting to see how many times Derek moves the furniture in his office. <laughs> it's just, it's just a, a constant thing with him. I think he was trained by his mother, you know, to do this, and I, I need to talk to both of them. They need help. But, <laughs> but, but I don't like change that much. I'm, I'm not big in that, see? Uh, but, uh, you know, when, as we make changes, there are things we need to think about. And that's what we want to do again tonight. This morning, we began to look at inspired advice for life. And certainly this fits our graduates, but it fits all of us as we think about our lives. The first thing that we noted this morning was, remember the instructions of your parents. Very important. Uh, they, they wanted the best for you. They may not always have done what was best, but they did what they thought was best in most cases. And we need to listen to them. We need to think about them. They may not even be among the living anymore. But like my mother, I can hear things that she said. My dad, uh, some things that he said, they still resonate with me. It ought to be that way. That's a good thing. And then we noticed that we need to hold on to kindness and truthfulness. So I think the word's mercy in the New King James Version, but uh, kindness is a good word for that. In fact, it's translated that way several times in the Old Testament. But also truthfulness. And truthfulness being, be true to yourself. Be true to what you were, what you were brought up to be. Be true to the, what you know about the Word of God. Those kinds of things. Your life, my life, ought to reflect those things. And then, well, we talked about how that Solomon, and all this is coming from Proverbs 3, that Proverbs uh, tells us that we should trust and rely upon God. It's unfortunate, but it's true that human beings will disappoint you from time to time. Uh, I'm, I'm not happy about that, I, but on occasion I have accidentally uh, disappointed people. It's just the way it works with we human beings. That'll never happen with God. God is, is trustworthy. He's reliable. If he makes a promise to you or to me or to anyone, he will follow through. Really, it's on that basis that Abraham was able to offer up Isaac because he trusted that if God said it, some way it was going to come to pass. And boy, that's, an, that's a powerful lesson to learn in our lives. And then this morning also, again from Proverbs 3, we looked at the idea of humble yourself before God. Uh, God is, is one that is worthy of us just putting our entirety under his control. Uh, bow down before him. He will not lead you astray. He'll not lead any one of us astray. We noted that, and the wise man said that, as we observed in Proverbs 3. Now this evening, we want to go on to say, be a good steward of what God gives you. Look at what uh, 
uh, the wise man wrote to his son, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. God owns everything. If you read the, the singer of Israel, uh, he puts it this way, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. Talking about God. It all belongs to him. And so he deserves to be, he should always be number one. In days gone by, I did a whole lot of uh, financial counseling. I don't know how I got into that. I, of course, I love fooling with figures. Maybe that was a part of it. The elders found out I'd been trained by some pretty sharp fellas. And so we'd have members that occasionally had struggles with finances. I'd sit with them, talk with them. And we build a budget for them. Guess what's at the top of the budget? God. So you mean you don't eat first? No. No, I put God first. If I put God first, everything else is going to work out. I've had people tell me, well, we don't have the money to give. And I say, you don't have the money not to give. That's the reality of it. If we give to God, we will be blessed. Look at Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, because it points out what we're trying to say here. There's one who scatters and yet increases the more. Now, we may not instantly identify what he's talking about there. Scatters? What is he talking about? Well, let's imagine a fellow that's just got just enough seed for this year's crop. That's all he's got. So he might, he might think in his human way of thinking, he might say, well, you know, uh, this crop might not go well. Maybe I ought to hold a little bit back. Maybe I ought to put some in storage, you know, because we can always use it next year. That's not what the wise man says. He says, there's one that scatters and yet increases the more. And the scattering here is their way of sowing seed. They didn't have these big planters. What? I don't know how many rows planters cover now. I've seen some that took up the whole highway when it was a, a two-lane highway. They're huge. And they, they lay down a lot of seed at a time. They didn't have that. What'd they have? They took a bag. They hung it over their neck. They'd reach into the bag and grab a handful of seed. And then they'd pull it out and they would, and they would scatter it. Some of you may have at home one of those things that you... You put your seed in, and you walk along, and turn the crank, and, and it, it whirls around, and the seed goes everywhere. Well, that's kind of the idea here. He, there's one that scatters, and yet increases the more. Here, laying all that seed out, you're going to get more back. That's what God says. Keep, keep listening, because he goes forward from there. And there's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. If you hang on to what you have, thinking, I'm going to get rich. I'm going to save it up. I'm going to be, he's, God says, it's going to lead to poverty. You're going to be impoverished spiritually, if nothing else. You're going to be impoverished. Then he goes on. The generous soul will be made rich. And he who waters will also be watered himself. Got to be careful to give to other people what you have available to give. Why? Because God will always make sure you get back in return more than you gave in the first place. In the book of Malachi, we find God issuing, well, really the only challenge that I know of God ever making in Scripture, where he literally uh, dared man, so to speak, just try me, test me. Here's God actually asking human beings, test me. Now, what's he talking about? Well, let's look at it together. Malachi chapter 3, begin at verse 8. Now, this is written, by the way, in, in the form of an exchange. God says, says something, and he imagines the way man would answer. And if you don't think God can figure it out, I, I think you need to rethink it. God knows how we think. And so here it comes. Listen to what he says. 
Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Look at that word, try me. Just try me. That's kind of the way we'd say it. Or, if you want to put it a different way, test me. Test me and see if I won't bring a blessing in your life so big that you cannot even imagine or have room to put it up, to receive it. Maybe I'm, my mind occasionally goes in these funny places, and when I, just as I said that, I thought, kind of reminds me of my subdivision. Do you know Teresa and I are among the very few in our subdivision who can actually park in our garage? Because everybody else's garage is full of stuff. I mean, totally full of stuff. Now, they're building more apartments in Clinton, you know, right now, like there are lots of places. So guess what else they're building? Storage units. Because we got more junk than you can put in one little place. We, we gather, we accumulate these things. Well, God doesn't want us accumulating material things. Here's what he does want us to do. You test me. You give as I have directed you to give. And when you do, I'll make it to where you had not got room to hold it all. In the book of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul basically goes down the same road. If you think about it, here's what he says, chapter 9, beginning verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. We need to recognize that you cannot outgive God. It's just simply impossible to do that. And based on that very fact, the wise man says to his son, be a good steward of what God gives you. But then he goes on, and he says, basically, let hardship be a teacher. Now, before I go any further, if you're in this audience, and you're above the age of 20, and you've never had anything hard happen in your life, I would suggest you need to get down on your knees and thank God. Because the rest of us have had hardship. Now, some, it started very early. I've, I bump into families from time to time, and I think, man, is there anything happens in their life but hard stuff? It's just, it's just one thing after another. This relative, that relative, this sister, this brother, this mother, this father. They just struggle with all kinds of difficulties. And that might lead, and in fact, it does lead some people to say, well, there can't be a God in heaven because things are too tough. And if there's really a God in heaven, it wouldn't be there. Listen to what the wise man says. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father, the son in whom he delights. If you love your child, will you discipline them? Well, think about it. Let's just think of an example. Let's say that you live on a kind of busy street, and your child is beginning to learn to ride a bicycle. It's got those training wheels on it, so it's not really technically a bicycle, is it? It's a quadcycle. Is, is more nearly what it is, but it's the beginning. It's the way we get started. And you say, now, you're allowed to ride this, but you cannot ride it in the street. Now, you know why you're saying that, and all of us that are old enough, we know too. Because if it's a busy street, you ride out in it, you may get run over. 
That's a possibility, isn't it? That that's going to happen. So what happens the first time? Because you know it's going to happen, right? What happens the first time that your child, despite your instructions, rides out into the street? Well, I can tell you what happened around my house. My daddy knew how to handle that situation. And, uh, and my behind knew the, uh, the consequences of violating that rule. Did he do that because he hated me? No, he did that because he didn't want to see me killed right there in front of the house. Or he didn't want to see me maimed, maybe a paraplegic for life. He didn't want that for me. And so he disciplined me. The writer of, of Proverbs, this wise man, says to his son, that's what God does. He uses hardship to help us change, to help us improve our lives. Look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1, where he goes on to say, Whoever loves instructions loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Now, my mother wouldn't let us say that word, but, but God can say it. And it's correct, isn't it? It is exactly correct. You, we, we need to learn to love instruction, don't we? We need to be a people that want to be corrected. Why? Because ultimately, I want to be in heaven, don't you? And if I'm going down the wrong road, I need to be changed somehow. I need to be motivated to make, make a move in the right direction. God does that. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, the writer of the Hebrew Christians actually basically seems to quote uh, from what uh, the wise man said here in Proverbs, when he says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. <laughs> I wonder how many of you, you know, there's a certain generation I feel, I think, knows what I'm talking about where mama or daddy would say, as they got ready to spank you, they would say, this is going to hurt me more than it does you. I don't know if you're in that generation or not, but I remember that very vividly. I remember that I, there was something I always wanted to say. Now, I was never stupid enough to say it, but I wanted to say it. Well, look, if it's going to hurt you that bad, let's just skip it. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say, you know. But, but uh, what the point is, it, it pains a loving parent to see their child do what they shouldn't be doing, what they know not to do. It pains us to see that. And so it hurts to have to discipline them, and yet that discipline is intended to keep us away from it in the future, to turn us aside. That's what God is doing according to the writer of Hebrews. I think Hebrews 5.14 is a partial explanation. Now, you're going to have to watch me here because I'm going to pull it together in a, in a way that you may not have thought of it, and you may come away at the end and say, well, I don't think you pulled that together right. Okay, let's think about it. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, here's my point. I believe that discipline is intended to exercise us, to get us in the habit of doing what's right, to keep us away from, from what is wrong. How are you going to grow up? The best way to grow up is get rid of the bad habits, keep the good ones. That's the best way. And so I believe that hardship can be a way to cause all of us to end up being better in the eyes of God. Now that's going to require us to think about things in a different way, isn't it? When trouble comes in life, I'm going to have to look at myself and say, what good could come out of this? What lesson might we learn? I have a dear friend and Valdosta, George, he's now, uh, I think, about 82 years old. And uh, he, he, he and I talked often. He'd talk about how his children were still learning and still growing, and that, that, <clears throat> that he thought that the troubles his children had were God's way of teaching him, you know, helping him to grow. 
a little bit. And so, every now and then he'd say to me, he'd say, Gary, I'm going to be so glad when I learn my lessons so that my children's lives can be better. <laughs> that was his answer to the thing. All right. We need to live a life of discipline, under God's discipline, looking for the good that can come out of it, grow up, be what he wants us to be, so that that discipline will result, hopefully, in a heavenly home. Because that's what we really long for. And then the wise man, writing to his son, says, search for wisdom. And I like that word, search. It is literally, in the New Testament, a pretty active word. When you think about Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and following, you have ask, seek, knock. Guess what? Every one of those words is, is active. Every one of them. Every one of them is an ongoing process. You don't quit asking, you keep on asking. You don't quit knocking, you keep on knocking. You don't quit seeking, you keep on seeking. That's the idea. Well, the wise man basically goes down that exact road. Listen to him uh, as, he, as he begins to talk about this uh, in, in verses 13 through 18. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. You know, <clears throat> I, I believe that Solomon wrote the bulk of the Proverbs. I think there's, there's ample evidence uh, in Scripture to suggest that he wrote most of the Proverbs. Now, I want, I want to think with you about when, when Solomon first became king. You remember God came to him? Y'all recall that? And what did God say? He said, what do you want? And what did Solomon ask for? Wisdom. Now reread this passage, because he says, long life, you know, comes out of wisdom. What else? Riches and honor come out of wisdom. Now think about Solomon's life. Did he get all that? He did didn't he? So he may be, at this point, writing from personal experience. This is what comes out of the search for wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 11, he again says, for wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. There's nothing better than wisdom. You have a big bank account, and if you're a fool, it's not going to help you. That's what he basically is saying. Now, the singer of Israel picks up that, that same idea as he portrays, you know, wisdom and the search for it and where it's to be found. Psalm 111, verse 10, for instance. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments and his praise endures forever. <clears throat> the Israelites, the Jewish people in their poetry, often used what's called parallelism. And all that is, is they'll say something, and then they'll come back and say the same thing with different words. We have to do that sometimes, don't we, to communicate. Sometimes I say something, and somebody will say, what? And, I'll, and then I'll change the word. So they can think about it and say, oh, oh, I get what you're saying now because I used a word they're more, more comfortable with, more familiar with. Well, the Jews in their poetry use that very thing. So go back and look at this again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. What is the fear of the Lord doing his commandments? That's what he just told you. That's what the fear of the Lord is. Do the will of God, 
And you'll demonstrate the fear of the Lord, and that is going to demonstrate good understanding. We could put a different word there, couldn't we? Wisdom. Wisdom. Now look at Psalm 119. You remember this psalm, longest chapter in the whole Bible, 176 verses. That is one, eight verses for every letter in the Hebrew alphabet. They only had 22, not like us, 26, but 22. And so he goes along. What's he doing? In this great song, he is singing praise to the Word of God. For every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, he sings eight verses of praise to the Word of God. In the midst of that, what does he say? Look at, for example, verse 98. Psalm 119 and verse uh, 98. And let's see what he has to say there. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. Now, I wonder if anybody here could say that our, uh, our enemies just disappear one day. I do remember a story that was told about a preacher one time, got in front of a congregation, kind of a large congregation. And he said, okay, <clears throat> I want everybody to stand up. And they all stood up. He said, okay, now everybody sit down if you still got a living enemy. Everybody sat down except one old man. And the preacher, his whole illustration ruined. <laughs> because one old man still standing up. He said, you don't have any enemies? And the old man said, no, sir. I don't have a single one. And he said, well, given that that's the, the road I'm going down on in this lesson today, I, I'd like you to explain that to me. How did you end up with no enemies? I outlived all of them. Do you have enemies? Uh-huh. You want to be wiser than them? Well, I think most of us would say, yeah, that, that would kind of be nice to be wiser than I am, my enemies. How that's, how's that going to happen? It's going to happen by looking to the Word of God. That's how it's going to happen, because God's wise. And if we look to His Word, we're going to realize what, what we need to be and who we need to be. And it'll make us wiser than our enemies. Now, Going down to verse 162, same Psalm 119, and he says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. Well, I'll say, if wisdom's found in the word of God, this is the treasure. <clears throat> I have a dear friend that in his young years, I, I can't realize, the guy had... He could read at a pace that was unbelievable. I mean, really. He'd, he'd read War and, War and Peace in three or four hours. If I read, well, I'm not through reading War and Peace yet, so forget that. That's a bad example. But, but, but the point is, he, he could read fast. So he had read every book that he could find that our brethren had written on you know, biblical ideas. And so he started picking up all kinds of of, of other material from the denominational world. And boy, not long after he started that, he'd come to me and he'd throw out ideas. And I'd go, ah, where'd you get that from? That, that's not in the Word of God. And he'd say, well, yeah, it is. And I'd say, no, not. we'd flip open the Word of God. And, oh, it wasn't there. In fact, just the opposite was there a lot of times. And I finally said, brother, what are you reading? Well, I'm reading, and he told me, you know, the different ones. And I said, there's your problem. As good as you are at reading, just read the Bible over and over and over again. Let me promise you, there's not a man living that can beat what this has to say. Not one man. That's a pretty good message for life, don't you think? What's your number one reading material in life? Well, it shouldn't be the sports page. It should be the Word of God. Because the Word of God can transform your life. So we've gotten a lot of wonderful instructions for life. If we'll listen to what the wise man says in Proverbs 3, we can be transformed, can't we? We can be made new every day if we go down that road. The most important thing, I believe, that we learn tonight is turning to God's Word to find out what we need to do in our lives. 
If you're struggling with sin in your life, whoever you are, all of us Christians, if we're struggling with sin, the Word of God tells us what to do. Don't give up. Don't throw up your hands and say, well, God will never want me back. I'm a terrible person. Well, you know, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, I'm sinner number one. Nobody beats me. I'm number one. And why did God show mercy to Paul? Paul tells you, read that whole first chapter right at the end of 1 Timothy. You know what he says? He showed mercy to Paul to demonstrate, to be an example to everybody else. God can forgive you. God's able to do that. You know, no matter how bad you are, God can forgive you. What does it take? It takes, listen to this, 1 John 1, 9, we kind of alluded to it this morning, hear it, if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just, forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word confess in Scripture literally means to say the same thing. Do you think God already knows about all my sins? What about yours? I think he knows about all of our sins. When I step out and tell folks I have sinned, even if I enumerate what I've done, God's already known that. He's already said it. My confession is the beginning of, in fact, it is the end of, if you really want to think about it, my forgiveness. As soon as I acknowledge that I did wrong, God is going to put it away told some of you this before, but I want to say it again. Brother Gus Nichols had a, a woman come to him, one of the sisters, you know, where he was preaching. She was in tears, just uncontrollable tears. And he said, well, sister, what is the problem? And she told him, told him about the sins that were in her life. And he said, well, uh, are you ready to turn away from that? Yes, I'm, I'm confessing this to you. I want to turn away from it. I'm confessing to the Lord. I want to turn away. Brother Nichols said, let's pray. And he prayed. And he specified what she'd specify. You know, please, Lord, forgive her of all these various sins. Well, boy, she went away so happy, uplifted. Everything was wonderful. But a few months later, she came in, uncontrollable tears. Same thing. And she said, Brother Nichols, I... I'm in trouble. I've, I've sinned. And she started to, to enumerate, again, all the previous sins. Every one of them. She said, Brother Nichols, will you pray for me? He said, no. She said, you won't pray for me? He said, no. Well, why not? He said, because God doesn't know anything about those things. He forgave them. He put them away. Now, sister... That's what you need to do. That's a pretty good answer when you think about it. The Word of God will support that. If you need to get rid of your sin, confess it. Let us pray for you, like James talks about, James 5, 16. But what about if you're outside of Christ? Some of you in this audience tonight have been hearing the gospel preached probably longer than I am old. And yet, for whatever reason, you've never obeyed the gospel. What about you? What better time than right now? You don't have a guarantee, nor do I, that we'll even be alive tomorrow. We have certainly had no guarantee the Lord won't come back today. If the Lord comes back today, you want to be ready, don't you? I know I do. How are you going to do that? Well, on the day of Pentecost, they cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer came back, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So take stock of your place in life right now. There's a way to correct it. For those in the church who stumbled, confess, ask for prayers. For those outside the church who have never put on Christ, well, put him on in penitent baptism. There's the solution. Life can be better. It starts with coming as we sing.
Let me tell you what's going to happen here in the next few minutes. We're going to have a closing song, and then we're going to have a closing prayer, and we'll be dismissed. If you're visiting with us and you do not want to stay for the honoring of the graduates, graduates that we're going to have following in about five minutes after that, after we close our services, you can, you can exit and leave the, leave the auditorium. But we'd love for you to stay. Also remember that after the presentations are made and everything, we have food in the back. So it, uh, it's, uh, you may want to stay around for that, okay? Yes. How come they're not there already? Yes. After the, after the uh, closing prayer, if all the senior families would move down to front here and these, these rows right up here and everything, I sure would appreciate it. Make it a whole lot easier because we have some presentations to give out, and so it would be um, convenient if you did that. Thank you. Our closing song will be 517. 517. If you weren't able to take the Lord's Supper this morning, it's been left prepared in B2. You can exit at this time out to the right, and uh, someone will be there to serve you. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ our Lord. She is His new creation by water and the Word. From heaven He came and sought her to be His holy bride. With His own blood He bought her, and for her life He died. Though with a scornful See her sore oppressed, her doctrine rent asunder by names and creeds distressed. Yet saints there watch our This time that we've been able to come out this morning and tonight to worship you and sing songs of praises to you, Lord, and learn more about your word. Lord, I pray that you would always give us the courage and the strength to always look to your word for the answers that we need throughout this life. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage to share that with others. Lord, thank you again for loving us. Thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. And thank you most of all for sending Jesus to down the cross for us so that we may have hope of eternal life with you in heaven one day. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.